What's up YouTube? Today we're going to be talking about soldering. Specifically, how to solder two stranded wires together. Now there are a few different ways to do this, but I'm going to show you how I learned. I don't do this by trade, but being a home mechanic, I quickly learned that soldering was a valuable skill and was essential in repairing or constructing virtually any type of electrical system. Soldering is going to be the strongest, longest lasting, most reliable way to join wires together from 0 AWG all the way down to 40. The key is when it is done properly. A poorly soldered connection will result in poor performance. Let's talk about the solder. When soldering electrical components, it is essential that you use electrical grade solder, meaning something acid free. Don't just grab the stuff you used to solder that one inch copper pipe last week. Acid core solder doesn't adversely affect the copper wire itself. The problem is that over time, the acid will eat through the wire's coating and probably the heat shrink too, exposing your connection and eventually leading to corrosion. Another thing to consider when talking about solder is flux. Flux basically oxygenates the metal you are trying to solder, ensuring a good joint. Although wire may look smooth, it's actually perforated and full of holes. The flux ensures the solder adheres properly. Try soldering without flux and watch the solder just roll off. To simplify this process, I recommend using rosin core solder. It is a tubular or hollow form of solder. The inner space of the solder is filled with a non-corrosive rosin flux, sort of like the lead in a pencil. That way there is no need to externally brush on any flux. Rosin core solder also comes in different tin to lead ratios, resulting in different melting temperatures. For general applications using medium to large gauge wire, I use 6040 because that has a melting point of about 370 degrees. Now that you know how the solder and flux works, let's talk about the soldering gun. For general applications, you'll have no problem using a gun that reaches a preset temperature. These are available almost anywhere and usually run between 20 and 50 bucks. You could even use a wood burner to solder, although it might not be as efficient as a tool specifically designed for soldering. If you're soldering wires to a circuit board, then you're going to want something that you can control the temperature on. But those can be pretty expensive. My only suggestion is you stay away from battery operated guns. You want something that's 115 volts that you can plug in. They generally get hotter and are more reliable than battery operated models. Also, stick with something that has a small conical tip or an angled chisel tip. These will allow you to do precision work. So now you have your solder and soldering gun ready, you're also going to need some heat shrink tubing, a damp sponge, a pair of wire stripping pliers, and a pair of wire cutters. You can use a razor blade to remove the coating on the wire, but then you run the risk of severing one of the inner wire strands. The first step is to use the wire strippers to remove about a half inch of coating on each wire. Now use the wire cutters to cut a piece of heat shrink tubing to about one inch long. Slide it down the wire as far away from the point of solder as possible. This will prevent the heat shrink from activating prematurely from the heat produced by soldering. Again, there are many methods to do this, but for the next step, I separate the wire strands and mesh them together. I found this to be the most reliable method, even when joining wires of different diameters. Some people use an X pattern and just twist the wires together. It's just more of a preference, I guess. Once the wires are meshed together, use one hand to pinch one side of the wire together and use the other hand to twist the strands together on the opposite side. Now repeat the process on the side you had initially pinched. Now that the wire is twisted together, let your iron heat up to its operating temperature. This Weller model lights up green when ready. Wipe the tip on a damp sponge to remove any previous buildup. Unroll yourself enough solder to work with comfortably and touch the solder to the tip of your iron. This process is called tinning. Tinning will help prevent oxidation of your tip and will also help heat transfer more efficiently to the wire you are soldering. The goal here is to just cover the tip in a very fine coating of solder. Now that your wire is prepped and your iron is ready to go, touch the tip against the wire. After about a second or so, you are ready to make the initial contact between the solder and the wire. 
The point of initial contact should always be where the tip of the soldering iron makes contact with the wire. What this is doing is forming sort of a bridge of molten solder between the tip and wire, essentially giving the tip a wider point of contact with the wire, allowing the heat to transfer to the wire much quicker. Once you begin this process, it happens in seconds. Begin by touching the solder to the initial point of contact and let the wire absorb the molten solder. Keep your soldering iron stationary and move the solder up and down the wire until your connection is completely covered. Be sure not to apply more solder than needed. A connection with excess solder will increase resistance. A good solder connection should be shiny and you should still be able to see the original shape of the wire. Now that your connection is cooled off, slide your heat shrink over the connection, making sure to overlap both ends of the insulation. I prefer to use a cigarette lighter to activate the heat shrink tubing, but you can use a heat gun or even the tip of your soldering iron. Just hover the tip over the tubing and move it around to use the radiant heat to activate the tube. Make sure you don't actually make contact with the tip because the tubing will melt very easily. Just heat up the tubing enough to melt it and form fit the wire. But this process can be very time consuming. If done properly, this connection will outlast the wire itself. Just to prove the strength of this connection, I ran a little test. I cut about 8 inches of wire and soldered the ends together. Once the connection cooled, I tried to rip it apart. 5 out of 5 times, the wire never broke within 1 inch of either side of my soldered connection, proving its strength. The only things I could think of that would cause your soldered connection to fail would be corrosion or in some situations if enough current is passed through the wire, heating it up past the melting point of the solder. Well, I hope you guys learned something new, and if you have any questions, I'm always reading the comments.